Okay. Well, welcome everybody. I'm Brad Stolbeck. I am uh, one of the members of our Trauma Interest Working Group Steering Committee, and I'm uh, excited for today's talk. Um, I'm going to go over our uh, housekeeping, and then I'm going to introduce our speaker. Um, first of all, for those who have not uh, been to any of our events before, or not familiar with the Trauma Interest Working Group, uh, the Trauma Interest Working Group provide, promotes the scientific interdisciplinary understanding of trauma to improve health equity on the south side of Chicago and beyond. We do this through education, scholarship, clinical care, community engagement, and advocacy. And anyone who is interested in getting involved or more involved with the group, feel free to contact um, me, bstolbeck at uchicago.edu, um, or Amy or Heidi, Amy Giles or Heidi Lee, who uh, you probably received some communication from. Um, this is the first talk in our um, speaker series for this year. What does safety mean to you? Community perspectives on uh, community perspectives on safety, and uh, this will be a set of forums that explore the various meanings of safety exploring policies, practices, and attitudes within their historical and current context, affecting the University of Chicago campus and our surrounding communities. Um, during the event, uh, please mute yourself and you can feel free to place questions in the chat, but um, uh, Dr. Kosi Gay is going to uh, wait till the end of his talk to respond to questions. Um, so you can save your questions or you can put them in the chat and they'll be responded to later. Um, the event is recorded and video will be available on the Mansueto Institute's YouTube channel afterward. Um, and you can sign up for the Trauma Interest Workgroup listserv by visiting list.uchicago.edu selecting Trauma Interest WG. Um, so I'm really excited to introduce our speaker Dr. Franklin Cozy Gay, um, who's been an important member of our group and also an important uh, partner in uh, addressing safety at UCM. Uh, Franklin's the executive director of the Urban Health Initiatives, Community and External Affairs at the University of Chicago Medicine. He was formerly the director of the University of Chicago Medical Center Violence Recovery Program. Before joining the UCM community, Franklin served as the Chicago Center for Youth Violence Prevention Project Director at the University of Chicago's Crown Family School of Social Work. He also volunteers as co-director for the 1919 Chicago Race Riot Commemoration Project and has over 25 years of experience developing, implementing, and evaluating school, family, community, and hospital-based violence interventions. His work emphasizes emerging public health practice beyond looking at at-risk behaviors. Instead, he researches upstream by examining root causes of violence, such as the physical, social, economic, and service environments to address social inequities tied to class and race. Franklin is skilled in using qualitative methods to access and understand the context connected to what factors increase risk and buffer youth from youth problem behaviors, he serves as the board chair for Organic Oneness and is a Firebird Community Arts and Bright Star Community Outreach board member. Um, I am always excited to listen to Franklin talk and I learn something uh, every time. And so I'm really grateful to him for agreeing to kick off this speaker series and I will hand it over to Franklin. Thank you, Brad. Appreciate you. It's, uh, um, it's an honor to be here, everyone. The, um, to the beginning and is everyone able to see my screen okay awesome awesome great well um thank you all again and you know again appreciate you all for just allowing me to have this space to um share an opportunity to talk a little bit about my work and so um I am proud to be a South Sider, starting off on the West Side, you know, school age years in the Park Manor community, just about two miles southeast of campus. 
um, in my former grandparents' home, the Great Migration family from Alabama. My mom and dad still live in this home. And, um, and as Brad shared, he shared a little bit about my background. And um, what I'd like to do is just talk a little bit about what does emerging public health look like? What does that look like? And so as we hear these words, root causes, emerging public health is actually looking to go beyond just the risk factors, but looking at living conditions, as Brad described a little bit earlier, um, not just focused on the areas related to risk and um, what factors buffer individuals from health-related issues, but also going upstream to looking at the physical, the social environment, economic environment, um, as well as the service environment. However, I want to add that in order to really understand upstream issues, it also needs to be, we need to be hit informed by history. And so what I like to do is open up with acknowledgement. And so I want to acknowledge the lands that we stand on. And I, I really want to uplift um, what Brian Stevenson says when we are talking about safety and we're talking about violence, we need to be mindful that we live in a post-genocidal society. Um, and so I want to make sure that in that space, providing recognition um, and gratitude for the lands that we stand on here. Um, all right. And so I humbly hope that when you walk away from this talk that you'll understand some key events that have happened in the history of Chicago that shape why Chicago looks like a tale of two cities. Um, and uh, many of these experiences are not unique to Chicago. I'd also like to just describe the hospital-based violence intervention program that um, I've had the opportunity to help advocate for. And in addition, I'd like to talk about some collaborative approaches that are used to help combat some of these root cause issues. With that being said, I am, you know, again, as Brad opened up, I have the pleasure and the honor of advocating for the Violence Recovery Program, which is a hospital-based program that's designed to take advantage of the window of opportunity that happens immediately after a violent trauma. In our case, we're focusing on individuals after they have been intentionally harmed. And our program is designed to intervene after patients have been stabilized, engaging the survivor of violence or the bereaved family, and ultimately through using psychological first aid and psychoeducation, help determine their person-centered goals. So, and quite often they are tied to social determinants of health, which include economic housing, uh, stability, food stability, and access to education um, and opportunities. With that being said, I do wanna shout out our team. We have a team of 16 staff who are housed in the emergency room 24 seven, um, 365 days a year. We also have three staff that are an outpatient clinic. And um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we've grown that model, particularly um, in 2021, where the city of Chicago saw its largest um, incidents of violence um, in over a quarter of a century, or really since the early 90s. Um, but with that being said, part of our model, we've been um, privileged to actually grow our program to really be a model, not a singular program, thanks to funding from Block, Hass and Fail Casting Collaborative for Family Resilience that allows us to integrate existing service lines like spiritual care, child life, social work, as well as existing programs like Healing Hurt People that Brad leads here at, um, at Comer that it's actually been a hospital-based violence intervention program that's been here at the University of Chicago since 2013. This collaboration through this multidisciplinary approach allows us to provide this coverage now um, 24 seven, 365 days a year. That being said, I wanna highlight kind of what the data look like in terms of um, over time. So over five and a half years, VRP has seen volumes um, of patients intentionally injured by violence, um, unlike any other um, trauma center across the nation. Our program alone has engaged over 9,100 patients since May 1st of 2018 through um, December 31st of 2023. What does that look like? 70% uh, have been suffered from gunshot injuries, 81% male, 96% African-American, 
86% were harmed by community violence, and 66% are between the ages of 19 and 40. Addressing root causes, as I you know, as I stated in the in the um, abstract, um, has become a famous phrase, and I've uplifted what emerging public health looks like and why I think it's important to have that solution um, or that approach or that frame. With that being said, what I'd like to do is actually take a moment to talk about what motivated me to turn towards a phenomenon that's connected to um, public health. And so what it does is that it takes me back as a um, elementary school student. It takes me back to riding the bus with my dad. My dad happened to be a CTA bus driver while he was working on his, um, his, his undergrad degree. And so um, during that time, I attended a, a, working class, a working class Catholic school in Bronzeville um, called Holy Angels. It's just maybe about a mile and a half straight north down on Cottage Grove. And every first Friday of the month, we would have no school. And so as a result, that was a child care issue. And I found myself riding my dad, riding the bus with my dad, and it would provide really a unique perspective of um, the industrial corridors along many different routes. But in particular, I like to highlight um, riding the 39th Street bus with my dad, Pershing Avenue, known as the 39. One thing that was clear as we were riding on the bus, there would be all white riders until we approached the Eastern public housing complex known as Wentworth Gardens. And from that moment, the white riders would disappear and it would be completely filled with um, black riders. And it's really interesting as we continue to go eastbound, we noticed the, uh, what turns out to be the largest concentration of public housing in the United States to the north of 35th Street was State Way Gardens, to the south of 35th was Robert Taylor Homes. Continued to go west and, um, excuse me, east, and we would see another massive housing complex, the Ida B. Well Homes, named after Ida B. Wells, who actually lived a considerable part of her adult life um, on the 3600 block of King Drive with her husband, who um, Ferdinand um, was actually responsible for the very first um, Black newspaper, The Conservator. Um, and so as you continue to go, this particular neighborhood was important for me because my school was actually um, right next to Ida B. Well Homes. And, and actually this pool was a pool that we would swim in. Uh, we had no gym at our school. And so I spent a lot of time in that space. As we continue to go eastbound, more housing complexes, including the Clarence Darrow Homes. What was really interesting also, as we passed the Clarence Darrow Homes, right near Drexel, um, right between Drexel and Ellis, would be the old Oakland Theater, which at the time when I was a kid happened to be the El Rukin Fort. The El Rukins um, is actually named after the Blackstone Rangers after Jeff Fort converted to Islam. And I used to see men walking in the neighborhood with Fez caps. And it was later that I learned that that actually had a history of an uh, actual gang organization but I was also told by my father that they were actually active in, actively involved in free lunch programs and social programs as well. And I wanna raise this up a little bit later. So we continue to go, the last public housing complex will be the Olander Homes. And then finally, we would have an opportunity to um, rest for a little bit at the turnaround at the lakefront. And my dad would tell me about just 10 blocks north um, about an incident um, called the Chicago race riots that involved a 17-year-old boy, Eugene Williams, who was um, attacked and eventually drowned um, for swimming in quote-unquote white waters. So this story goes back to the origin story connected to what actually motivated African Americans to come to the North. It was through this process of what is known as the Great Betrayal or the Compromise of 1877, where W.E.B. Du Bois talks about, really, the slave went free and stood in a moment in the sun and then moved back again towards slavery. Basically, what happened 
and there was that backroom deal to make sure um, that, that Hayes would receive the votes that were necessary. Hayes would only get that if he agreed to Tilden, who was his competitor at the time, to remove the troops that were actually enforcing the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. This great betrayal or the compromise of 1877 is the birth of the Jim Crow era. And it, that completely changed and created a new form of slavery and slave codes that dictated behavior and dictated monitoring that many believe still serve as a, a, a mechanism in terms of how the black body is monitored and over-occupied by police. With this being said, something key happened um, in World War I. Immigration stopped and dropped by 90%. Many industrial corridors like Chicago needed to fill those factories. And where did they get their bodies? They got their bodies from African-Americans that were seeing opportunity for employment, opportunity to actually achieve the very protections that were present for, through the 14th and 15th Amendment. Um, and so they went to northern cities like Chicago. And in Chicago, we saw a, a increase of nearly 100,000 Black people um, over approximately 10 years. Um, and that response to that increase in population was a violent response that I want to uplift that many individuals don't know. Despite 100,000 Black people living in Chicago, it still only represented about 4% of the, the entire population. But what African-Americans finally found out like in the South, that their movement would be restricted through violence. Many of the Black uh, migrants that ended up in Chicago ended up in the community that was described as the Black Belt, restricted to areas. How did they enforce that area? They enforced that through physical violence. That physical violence alone between 1917 and 1919 uh, accounted in 27 ho homes that were bombed including this home over to the right um, that was on 34th in Indiana um, that was fatal for a seven-year-old girl. One thing that many people uplift today when it comes to uh, homicides is the clearance rate in Chicago. Many currently believe that you can get away with murder. This theme has existed for about 100 years in Chicago. Despite 58 individuals, homes being bombed, being left homeless, individuals harmed, not a single person was arrested. Ida B. Wells Barnett, um, in a July 7th editorial, actually said that Chicago was beginning to rival Jim Crow South. Ida B. Wells' op-ed that was approximately two weeks before the worst incident of racial violence in Chicago, the Chicago race riots, earlier I described when I was riding the bus with my father, and the incident that happened that involved a 17-year-old boy, that death and the refusal to arrest the man that many of the babies saw caused Eugene Williams to drown, resulted in the worst incident of racial violence in Chicago that resulted in 38 individuals killed, 23 of them were Black. Despite the fact that two-thirds of the individuals that were injured were Black, Two thirds of the individuals that were arrested were also black. It's a common theme that we see currently in 2024. Chicago was not unique to this experience. There were over 25 different anti-black riots that erupted across 15 states. And what was different is that African-Americans were fighting back. The new Negro movement was best captured by Claude McKay's If We Must Die and specific attention to the last two lines of, of Claude McKay's poem. Like men, we face the murderous cowardly pack, pressed to the wall, dying, but fighting back. W.E.B. Du Bois brought up the irony of African-American men fighting in World War I to defend democracy and not having the dignity to have their own democratic values protected in the United States. We return, we return, from fighting, we return fighting. Why do I bring that up? I strongly believe in many of my partners that I 
do work with that actually address root causes that the 1919 race riots serve as an origin story for violence, or excuse me, for segregation in Chicago, economic housing segregation. However, this also served as, as a different mechanism that went from extra legal approaches to actually policies and practices. Restricted covenants now, instead of using physical violence, was used as a method to, and an agreement to not rent or sell a home to African Americans. Approximately four or five blocks from where we are now on campus, if you go to 61st, 6140 South Rhodes, you'll see Lorraine Hansberry, a marker that represents Lorraine Hansberry. Her playwright, the first African American playwright to be performed on Broadway, Raisin in the Sun, captured the dynamic of restricted covenants and actually the fight that her father, um, you know, despite being kicked out because of restricted covenants, refused and fought it all the way to the Supreme Court to make restricted covenants unconstitutional. But what we begin to find out is that despite that happening, there would be new mechanisms, including red lines. Redlining became the catch-all term to describe a series of policies that were also not only private policies, but also actually um, endorsed by federal government at all levels. Um, essentially, that would create a division in terms of individuals being able to invest in homes, being able to invest in businesses, and most importantly, creating equity that could help them towards their dreams of, of you know, achieving American goals of financial freedom. Another mechanism that tie to that, we go back to this area where I was on the bus with my dad. As a young child, I recognized seeing the riders, how they would disappear, you know, in the, in the 80s, where, you know, as we got closer to the Dan Ryan. It wasn't until I got a lot older that I didn't recognize that this area here where the Dan Ryan is actually was the entrance to the Black Belt. Those were Black communities that were disrupted. Mayor Daley specifically planned to make sure that it would not go to the left of this image, which is through the Canaryville and the Bridgeport communities, which were predominantly Irish American, that they would actually go through the Black Belt, which later would be coined as Bronzeville, thanks to Chicago B and Anthony Overton's work um, connected to um, pride, Black pride in Chicago. And so with that being said, this is another movement that not only disrupted Black families, it also led to white flight. As African-Americans found out when they arrived around post-World War I through restricted areas in which violence was being used, exploitation continued, where African-Americans now were victims of predatory housing contracts in which they had, were signing agreements that were essentially fake mortgages um, and that process alone contributed to a three to four billion dollar wealth gap between white Chicagoans and black Chicagoans. It impacted nearly 75 percent to 95 percent of black families in Chicago, including my grandparents over on 71st and Rhodes, where my parents still live to this day. So we begin to see as white flight opportunities for, for suburban sprawl, thanks to highway systems, thanks to businesses now following, and the encouragement through low interest FHA loans that African-Americans would not qualify for, we begin to see that the city of Chicago is not investing in housing, they're hyper-investing in policing. Unfortunately, this over-occupation in policing has a, a, a pernicious legacy that's tied from 1919 to Laquan, Laquan McDonald's 2016, to 2023. Many of us know that when you look at Chicago, there are three high areas um, that are connected to the highest rates of violence. But the other part of that is the spatial, um, the way violence is spatially concentrated on the South and West sides. You look at the pattern of inequity, you look at the COVID rate, you see a similar pattern. You look at poverty, you see a similar pattern, as well as access to fresh foods and just grocery stores in general. So just as in the 50s, the um, construction or the urban renewal projects and national highway systems 
that went through Black communities. What we do see in the late 20th century is a recycling of the disruption that happens that actually when we say, what does public safety mean? Or what does safety mean to me? Safety means our ability to come together to support each other, our ability to be cohesive, to talk about what we want in our neighborhood. We think now being as Chicagoans with the recent snow that we have, you often see individuals having chairs that are out, you know, quote unquote dibs to protect a parking spot. The ability for individuals to support each other, but when you disrupt communities, like the largest concentration of housing disruption that happened in, happened here in Chicago, what you are doing is that you're disrupting the things that help keep communities safe, such as cohesion and informal social control. We also begin to see a divestment in things such as mental health access, where we see that there is a, a over 400% difference in terms of access to mental health therapists compared to um, north side of Chicago compared to the south and west sides of Chicago. Eve Ewing's book, Ghost in the Schoolyard, captures greatly the impact that housing destruction had on schools. We had the largest destruction of housing. We had the largest destruction of public schools here in Chicago. And instead, again, this consistent theme of hyper-investing and policing and instead, now what you're doing is that you are now creating unsafe communities by not having the ad adequate social services that should be funded by our government. And instead, investing in occupation and monitoring that has a theme that goes all the way back to slavery. So why am I bringing this up? Unfortunately, a lot of times when we talk about school-based programs, family-based programs, community-based, or even hospital-based, we think about individual level impact, or we might even think about relational level impact. What are we doing when it comes to families? How are we intervening on monitoring, cohesion, relationships between peers? But if we're truly invested in safety, we need to be invested in understanding our history. We need to understand that history does not lead, that omission of history, excuse me, does not lead to healing. So thanks to work through community-led collective impact work that was led by Pastor Chris Harris out of Bright Star Community Outreach, we had an opportunity to connect with a historian that was learning about how Germany was grappling with a difficult history. During this time, we also learned about what was happening in terms of community readiness to tackle these difficult issues. I'm very embarrassed to say that where we were in 2019 to where we are now, we're taking a lot of steps back. Um, but during this time, we start to see the removal of Confederate monuments. We started to see a, a, um, a level of critical awareness around who we're recognizing and who we're memorializing. We also saw Reparations won a um, $5.5 million settlement that was connected to police misconduct as it pertained to John Burge and the Midnight Crew. We see in the city of Chicago in 2019 establish its first Office of Equity and Racial Justice. And we see more of an emphasis that's focusing on, on um, uplifting the difficult past and ways that we can actually enhance that. What we have done through our project, Chicago Race Riots 1919 Commemoration Project, is actually partner with Facing History, Facing Ourselves. In 2019, it was mandated that all Chicago public schools, uh, 10th graders, have this curriculum taught in their class. We had the privilege of not only helping to um, contribute to the curriculum, but to also pilot it with students through One Summer Chicago. As I mentioned before, um, in 2019, January, in Roberts Temple Church, over on 40th and State, which is an institution you all should know about because it served as a catalyst for the civil rights movement in 1955. A mother decided to have an open casket ceremony uh, to a, a memorial, excuse me, to uplift what racism 
did to her 15-year-old son, Emmett Till. It was in this space where we were focusing on four issues connected to collective impact, high quality programs for families and for youth, trauma-informed care, social justice, and workforce development. And it was there that I had an opportunity to meet Professor Peter Cole, who shared how Germany was grappling with a difficult history. As a result, we said, why don't we connect with artists to uplift the worst incident of racial violence in Chicago's history? And thanks to um, the, one of the co-founders that introduced me, Dr. Brad Stolbach um, of Project Fire and the artistic director, Pearl Dick, we went to their executive director and to the team to, say, to tell them about how we're trying to connect the history, the historical roots of segregation in Chicago from the 1919 race riots, working with individuals that had been exposed to violent trauma themselves through Project Fire. As a result of this, we're very proud that we had an opportunity to receive funding from Niantic. Many of you um, have heard of Pokemon Go. Um, Pokemon Go, um, the developers of that augmented reality video game post George Floyd wanted to contribute to social justice issues. They heard about our project. At the same time, the city of Chicago was reimagining structures, monuments, school names. And as a result, we had an opportunity to compete for the Chicago Monuments Project that reimagined public art. And I'm very proud to say that we are among eight other groups that have received funding to actually support the art that Project FIRE is creating to embed in sidewalks. One thing that I wanna highlight is that we often do many different tours to uplift the work that we're doing. And I will be plugging an upcoming bike tour that we hope that, that on July 20th, during, that, during our sixth annual bike tour that we'll be installing art into um, at least what the area is described as the vortex of violence where five individuals were killed near 35th and state. And these are a couple of the historical marker prototypes. So part of this, what does public safety mean? Public safety means acknowledging the harms of the past, but it also means making redress for the harms that have happened. Through this mobilization, through lecturing, through bike tours, we had an opportunity to connect with a descendant of a politician, a Cook County Commissioner, Frank Reagan, who actually financed one of the gangs that was described as social athletic clubs, the Reagan Coats. Many times when we talk about gangs, it has a black and brown face, but the largest gang and the first gang was the Reagan Coats. Dr. Reagan shared that she gets an endowment every year and she wanted to donate $20,000 of her endowment that came from Frank Reagan towards reparations because Peter and I connected at Roberts Temple's church through the, this community action council work, we thought it would be best to connect that work back to the students from the Bronzeville community. As a result, we created the Eugene Williams scholarship that's connected to Eugene Williams to uplift his life in a different way. Dr. Reagan is still currently working with Organic Oneness to search for descendants for additional reparations. So it's difficult for me to bring up some of the mechanisms that are tied to um, housing without also talking about structural mechanisms that have happened. I failed to mention that when it came to restrictive covenants, when it came to urban renewal, the University of Chicago is well documented as, as being complicit in the very factors that we're talking about today, public safety, restricted covenants, the disruption of black families, the disruption of the ability for Black families to generate wealth. The other level of structural mechanisms that have happened is not having a, a level one trauma center on the south side of Chicago. Many of us in this space were actually active in this process. I'm very humble um, that many of us know the story, so I, I won't dive deep into the story, but what I do want to uplift is that the strength of community activism is actually what helps put pressure to make things happen and to generate that political will. Despite the mobilization that happened after Damian Turner's death, who was an activist in the Woodlawn community, shot just four blocks outside of 
what should have been a level one trauma center outside the University of Chicago had to go eight miles, eight to nine miles north to Northwestern. And as a result, he died. Had there been a level one trauma center, he would still be living. He might be the mayor of Chicago right now. So why do I bring this up? I wanna tie this back. It's important when we are talking about our interventions that we do think about and that we take into consideration the structural risk factors. What you see here is, is a model in terms of how we interact with victims of violence and survivors of violence, bereaved families, and the process in which we engage participants through this multidisciplinary approach and how we connect with community violence interventionists, credible messengers in the community, right? So I bring up credibility because in Chicago and in cities like Chicago, you can have resources, you can have programs, you can have strategies for safety, but unless you acknowledge the interpersonal trauma that's happened, as well as the structural trauma, you're missing out on the opportunity. Individuals that are engaged in intervening and keeping the community safe are individuals that have experienced that themselves. And so it was very important for our program to make sure that our staff possess that capital and that we also coordinate with individuals that possess that capital. So what do I mean? And I like to use Paula Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed as an example. Community violence interventions, which is recently have expanded and rebranded. Many of us know about street outreach work, but they've expanded to really three disciplines that focus on community level case management, community level victim advocacy, as well as street outreach mediation. What we are experiencing, a snapshot, is essentially sub-oppression. The violence that we see is sub-oppression that's basically trying to liberate yourself because you are harmed by harming someone else. Street outreach worker has had that experience or CBI worker, and so they're able to take their cultural capital knowing how you navigate through these structural and interpersonal um, constraints, using their human capital about who they are as a human being to be able to connect. And it is through that space that individuals witness and imagine I could be that. If I'm seeing rivals come together, then perhaps I can do that. If I could see this person who has caused harm in the community or maybe has been harmed, but now they are essentially doing public health work in the community, I can do it. And when I experience it as well, it creates true liberation, which is self-liberation. You liberate from within, not through a program, not through charity, but through within. And so the final component is actually going through that, understanding as humans, there's flexibility and persistence and accessibility that's needed um, that's connected to that work. And it is that that is important for us in terms of connecting with community violence interventionists through our work. Our, we have staff through our violence recovery program that also have that experience as well. And the bottom line is that when it comes to behavioral change, individual level behavioral change, individuals that understand the structural mechanisms, but they're also asking individuals to make sacrifices that they made themselves. So as a result, we have partnered with many of the organizations that are a part of the 14 organizations across 27 neighborhoods that have been, again, that map that I showed, durably exposed to violence really over the past 50 years. I'd like to highlight that in 2021, we expanded our work to have funded relationships in our highest value communities, which include Woodline, South Shore, and South Chicago. I wanna highlight Carlos Robles and Christine Goggins as you know, having the intellectual capital to say, this is what we need to do. CBI work has been shown to actually reduce shootings. This is a report from Northwestern's uh, Corners report that really indicates in most of the areas where there's CBI work in comparing 2023 to 2021, you saw significant declines across those major 27 communities with the exception of uh, four to five communities. It also allows us to collaborate with community partners using systems that they have. And I'm sorry, I know I want to give time for questions. Um, 
what I do want to uplift really quick, I'm going to try to wrap up in less than five minutes, and I apologize. Um, it's important to invest in this coordinated collaborative approach. There's no one type of solution. A violence recovery program cannot solve issues that have, have been baked for over 100 years. Coordination with credible individuals at the front line is very important, but it's not limited to just that. It's also important that we coordinate with other institutions like hospitals, with our, also with our political leaders as well. Right? And also, what are we doing to heal the healers? What are we doing on campus to coordinate with each other? When I went from doing community-based work that I felt probably the most satisfied um, between 2015 and 2019, uh, excuse me, 2021, to joining the Violence Recovery Program, I noticed the burnout, the vicarious trauma, and the impact. We have resources that are here on campus. What are we doing to connect those resources? I'm very proud that since November 2022, we've partnered with John Sykes, um, through his According to Sykes, to provide vicarious uh, trauma group consultation that is biweekly and virtual during our quote unquote lower volume months and then weekly and in person during our higher volume months. Other thing I want to uplift is work um, from a multidisciplinary um, team that, in, that is led by Dr. Tanya Zacherson, um, partnering with Legal Aid Chicago, as well as Liz Tong um, and many, many others, including our team. We recognize that when it comes to true recovery, it's really around what are we doing to make sure that they get access to public benefits for economic housing and employment stability. And so what we're doing is, is a research study, um, again, that's led by Dr. Zacherson, to understand the impact and the feasibility. And um, what we're already seeing from pilot data is that it's highly feasible, obviously. And this is something that we need to make sure that there's an infrastructure for going forward. We will be in phase two soon to do a randomized control trial to really look at some of the outcomes compared to just being in a hospital-based violence intervention program through case management and victim advocacy, as opposed to BRP plus recovery legal care, which is our medical legal partnership. I'm gonna wrap up with some questions, really. I am also partnering with Miles Francis, the project director over the Chicago Center for Youth Violence Prevention, Clarice Robinson, doc student over at the Crown School of Social Work, as well as Carla Galvin, who was leading important training work through Communities Partnering for Peace, as well as my partner in peace, Dr. Tanya Zacherson, looking at the actual systems that exist that should be available for recovery, such as crime victim compensation, and the enormous barriers that exist in terms of not even knowing about that there's four thousand, four, excuse me, forty-five thousand dollars that's allotted to victims of crime that there are issues connected to eligibility, there is a lack of clarity in timelines, and, there, and, and that despite the history that I showed, despite there have been billions and billions of dollars of wealth gap because of policies and practices tied to race and racism, this program alone is still a reimbursement program. So I wanna close up by just asking, for me, what does safety mean? It's how do we account for the harms of the past? What I like to do is questions for this group, and I apologize that I don't, I'm not giving you more time, but how do we continue to promote an infrastructure for prevention and intervention while also uplifting structural inequities? Our work, Southside ARC, is driven by Mullins and Darity's work that highlights the key components of reparation, which includes acknowledgement, redress, and, and, and closure, excuse me. How can we collectively contribute to including redress strategies in the recovery narrative? What are we talking about in terms of compensation? Why is a crime victim compensation a reimbursement program, right? And so what are other novel ways that we can explore reparations? Safety means to me addressing the past harms. That means acknowledging them, redress for them, and then eventually having closure from that. So I want to open it up for questions and thank you very much.
Thank you, Franklin. It is really uh, rich, tons of information. I think people are absorbing it. Um, and I think rather than putting questions in the chat, if people have questions, they want to come off mute and uh, we'll go from there. Franklin, thank you so much for those very important comments, not only the historical perspectives of where we've been, but also um, ways in which we're addressing issues in the here and now. Um, I put into the chat just a moment ago um, and mentioned the issue of restorative justice as a model, but one of the things that I think that this also, uh, in ways in which we can think about this um, and you and, and, and Tanya and, and Liz and others are thinking about this from an economic perspective. The question of doing so to some extent in retrospect with uh, reimbursement really needs to be pushed forward into additional economic development and educational development for our communities that have been um, disproportionately affected uh, by these issues. And uh, I may not be something that you are able to provide any answers to, but the question is, how can we partner um, with community in terms of seeking that type of development moving forward? Because those types of things are actually preventive steps in terms of thinking about the issues that we're, we're struggling with uh, moving forward. No, thank you, Dr. Miller. Thank you. And, you know, it, it the another theme of what I was trying to convey was the power of you know collaborations and coordination, and so connected to that is you know opportunities to partner with industries that are focused on economic development. What's important for me before that relationship starts is that we need to be on the same page of recognizing and acknowledging the actual financial harms, and I in my practice now, I think the older I get, the more courageous I get, right? To say, I don't wanna talk about this without talking about that. And so um, I think that part of it is recognizing the what are the seeds that actually feed real collaboration. And if we can have partnerships that agree to acknowledge the harms, then I think that those will be, that could be the beginning steps of a fruitful partnership. But I agree, Dr. Miller. And I see Tanya's hand and your point in the chat. Thank, thank you, Franklin. And I, I just want to say, I mean, this is a phenomenal, phenomenal uh, presentation that I think has to be mandatory in our medical schools and anyone that is remotely involved in healthcare. Everyone for our faculty on campus, our nurses, certainly everyone in the trauma center. Um, we can chat offline about helping to develop a trauma-informed care curriculum that your your slides and information would be phenomenal to, uh, to uplift the message and put that in there. Um, but you also remind me in such a great way that's that's so important about you know what I put in the chat about how do you measure the the impact of the economic impact in particular of these racist policies that have gone on over the years. Because we're we're quite unique in Chicago for the reasons you mentioned, not just because of this, you know, very nefarious history that we've had of so much structural racism, um, you know, and and the Great Migration, which to me is just like internally displaced refugees fleeing terror, uh, which would be their title in any other country, but. Um, how do you measure the economic impact of the, the racist policies and the racial terror and violence? Uh, and, you know, I wonder, we're, we are a unique group because there are, uh, you know, programs, like you mentioned, that do engage in reparations, you know, whether it's for the Chicago police, you know, torture, and now we have the Justice Center, to the work going on in Evanston. And everyone on this call, we all have different skill sets. How do we measure the public health impact 
of reparations. I think that would be fascinating. And we have, you know, colleagues. I was in a meeting this this morning with uh, David Himmelstein and Steffi Woolhandler, and some of their interns. They're kind of they're a social justice research group over at Cambridge. One of their their interns literally published a paper about rape and forced pregnancy in states that eliminated abortion after Dobbs, and it was on Democracy Now this morning. Like they're they're doing impactful work, but they also were the ones that brought the research on the Mtala law. Um, uh, that or the the research actually ended up contributing to the Mtala law. My my point being is, how can we at the University of Chicago either intrinsically here ourselves or you know partnering? and collaborating with other colleagues, you know, should we therefore, Franklin, in your opinion, focus on that economic metric, that measure, and also maybe the economic measure leading to health outcomes of what reparations, you know, help or do if they do help at all, which I have a strong opinion that they do, you know, but how do we even measure that? Um, I think if anything, you know, you would lead, we are the team here in the, the university to, kind of uh, take that up and examine that question very deeply. But what I, I'd love to know your opinions on that. And just thank you so, so much for your presentation. It was phenomenal. Thank you, Tanya. And, and just thank you for your leadership in this work. And it's just been an honor to be a, a partner, partner of peace with you. Um, and so, you know, one thing that comes to mind is, you know, I, I think that's just kind of implicit. You know, some folks kind of casually say, you know, I say, let's start with the University of Chicago, right? Um, has there been a summit to really, you know, talk about the ways that, you know, there have been books that have documented, um, and I'm happy to share a list of books that document, you know, University of Chicago's um, complicity in terms of restricted covenants, um, as well as urban renewal projects. Um, it would be great to really host a summit like around economic harm just from the university alone. Like we have all this talent. We have a world renowned, you know, economic like department here with, with five or six Nobel Prize winners uh, for economics. Um, I think that, you know, we have, you know, just like all this, you know, convene talent and, you know, here right now, how can we convene something kind of locally? So my opinion is that we start hyper local. Um, and, and I think that, you know, and, and to, to all of the amazing talent we have to their credit, maybe something happened, you know, as we continue to talk about it, maybe there has been. So, you know, how can we revisit that? Um, so that that's, you know, my reaction. I see Robin, your hands up. Hi, thank you so much, uh, for this wonderful presentation. Um, it's, it's been great, uh, first time attendee. So really learning a lot. Um, so I work within Title IX. I provide support to students who've experienced sexual misconduct. And I think a lot about the ways in which um, that system can, can reaffirm some of the, the carceral system and can kind of mimic it and can lead into a lot of the issues that you're talking about today. Some of these disparities, we see those mimicked and mirrored a lot of times within Title IX, within some of those um, sexual misconduct federal laws. And so I'm just wondering what your thoughts are. You know, we're trying to introduce more restorative justice. So I love that you talked about that. Um, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on how to navigate um, you know, certain uh, around preventing the harm on campus without kind of um, reaffirming and and reinventing and, and mimicking some of those harms that we see that create those disparities that look a lot like our carceral system right now and and create those segregation systems all over again within our campus and within our campus community. It's, it's something I think about a lot. Oh, thank you, Robin. And, and there's a lot in that question, and I want to make sure I understand it. Um, so as we're raising these issues um, and, and convening individuals around um, these harms, are you saying how do we do it without reproducing the harm or? Yeah, yeah. I think I think a lot of the ways that um, these issues show up on campus and the ways that we engage in in punish and in punishment and in 
carceral styles of judgment, we end up reproducing a lot of the same harms that we see within the carceral system yeah. that kind of falls along some of these similar racialized lines. Yeah, no, thank you. And, um, you know, that it's, and this this came up recently, um, and I'm trying to remember the person, um, but it's recognizing that like our systems of discipline don't work. They have the wrong frame. So restorative practices need to be the frame. Um, I think um, one thing that I'm challenged with, and I'd love you know for Brad to chime in, even with you know I described the work that our Project Fire is doing right with recognizing this harm and and why we think it's important as a kind of collective group. The artists, some artists are like, I'm over that shit. Like that happened in the past. I'm trying to recover, and you're bringing up stuff that is taking away my shine, right? And so how do we have these complex conversations without, you know, acknowledge them, but without also causing harm is pretty is it's pretty difficult. Um, and that's something that, you know, continue conversations and relationships is the approach that I'm taking it, right? Like recognizing, um, you know, validating their concerns. Um, but I think that it has to be done with a restorative frame understanding that the way that we discipline has not worked, right? Um, and I was trying to think of a very simple example um, that recently came up, um, but, but I, you know, I, I don't know what others think, but that, you know, using that restorative frame is going to be very important, understanding the complexity and that um, it's not going to be a one-shot thing. You have to develop relationships with the restorative frame to bring up these difficult issues. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I, we are out of time, but just since you since you uh, called on me, Franklin, I would say your comments just highlight the complexity and the need to be doing the work at multiple layers at the same time. So working with people on an individual level to, to try to support their recovery, um, to provide the care and treatment that they need is one layer, one level, but it's never going to get to the the larger systemic issues. It's it's a necessary component for people to be in a position to to be empowered, um, but we have to continue doing the work at the system and structural level as well. Um, I I know we're out of time. I know there there are a lot of um, other questions and comments that people probably could make at this point, but I just want to thank you, Franklin, for for uh, your leadership in in uh, teaching us and continuing to raise these issues and to call on us as individuals and on our institution to do the right thing. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for your patience through that presentation. I appreciate you all. appreciate the work you do. Take Thank you, care. Franklin. Yeah. Phenomenal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Franklin. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Appreciate it. So thank you. <laughs>